Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Olia Abasolo. I'm an Olympian and a member of the education team at the International Testing Agency. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the seventh ITA monthly educational webinar of 2022. And today we'll talk about therapeutic use exemptions. Before I introduce the topic and our panelists, please allow me to do a few minutes of housekeeping. We always deliver our webinars in five languages. So on your Zoom menu, you should see a button called interpretation. So if you click on that, you can listen to the audio in English, French, Russian, Spanish, and Arabic. Of course, the original audio today is in English, and so are the slides, but you have an option to tune in in other languages today. So today's webinar is part of our educational monthly series that are publicly available and designed to tackle key anti-doping topics and to raise clean sport awareness. So a big thank you to those of you who are regulars, and I see some familiar names in the chat. And of course, a big welcome to anyone joining us for the first time today. So as for all of our sessions, it goes without saying that we encourage debate, interaction, and questions. But we do not tolerate any kind of aggressive behavior or abusive or racist language. We trust that you will all join us in the spirit of fairness, respect, and integrity. Some other housekeeping points, please do use the chat function. And I can see many of you are already. You can tell us where you're from, what sport federation or what sport you compete in, sport federation that you represent or sport that you compete in, and your role. So I'll give a few shout outs to those first few that wrote in the chat. Hello to Malaysia Fencing, Dr. Ahmed, Guatemala, Netherlands Curling, Indonesia, Switzerland, Turkmenistan, Sri Lanka Anti-Doping Agency, Italy, Mexico, and so many more of you that are writing to say hello. Of course, a reminder that you can use the Q&A function to ask us questions related to today's topic. And a final note here that all of our webinars are recorded and the English version will be on our website and YouTube channel in a few days. So as always, it is my pleasure to give a shout out to our presenting partner for these webinar series, and that is Informed Sport. Their investment allows us to deliver this webinar program free of charge and in multiple languages. Informed Sport is a global certification program for supplements that batch tests products for substances prohibited in sport. As supplement contamination continues to be one of the leading causes of inadvertent doping, we encourage all athletes and athlete support personnel to check products before use at sportwetestutrust.com. And finally, a quick mention that the ITA is proud to be recognized by UNESCO as a leading international organization for the delivery of anti-doping programs. And this educational webinar is delivered with the support of the UNESCO International Convention Against Doping in Sport. Without any further delay, let's move on straight to the topic of this webinar, and that is therapeutic use exemptions, or TUE for short. We know that this is a very important aspect of anti-doping, that athletes and their support personnel need to understand. TUEs give athletes the authorization to participate in sport while using a medication or a method of treatment that is prohibited as per the World Anti-Doping Agency's prohibited list. The concept of TUEs and the exemption process can be quite daunting for many athletes and of course, even support personnel as well. So, we have put together this session to give you more confidence as you navigate this area of anti-doping. 
So I would now like to welcome our panelists who can turn on their cameras so we can welcome them. First, I will introduce Dr. Margot Mountjoy. Margot is a former international level artistic swimmer and is now a member of the IGF Medical Committee, previously having worked in a similar role with FINA for over 20 years. She's also the chair of the ASWAF Medical and Scientific Group and a member of the IOC Medical Commission Games Group. Her work in anti-doping also includes 20 years with the Canadian NATO as a TUE committee vice chair. She works internationally in anti-doping as a member of the World Rugby Anti-Doping Advisory Committee. And she was on the TUE committee for the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. Margot, thank you for being here today and welcome. I can see that you said <laughs> thank you, but you're on mute. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me today and to the audience for your interest in this topic. Excellent. Thank you, Margot. Next, I'd like to introduce Pedro Goncalves. Pedro is the science and medical manager at the International Testing Agency. He has over 12 years of experience in anti-doping with a background in science and previous research in biophysics. And he's currently in charge of therapeutic use exemptions and works on the pre-games and re-analysis programs for major events like the Olympic games and the world championships of different sports. And a side mention that Pedro is also an amateur rower, which we'll talk about later in this webinar. Welcome, Pedro. Hi, uh, yeah. hello to everybody. It's uh, always a pleasure to talk about this and uh, share with uh, everybody around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Let's take a quick look at the agenda for today. So we will first introduce the concept of therapeutic use exemptions. We'll talk about who requires a TUE and what the conditions are for a TUE to be granted. We'll also spend some time on TUE application timelines and some details of the process. We'll go over common conditions for which a TUE is required. And we will wrap up with the TUE life cycle and some useful tips. Again, we will leave some time for your questions at the end, so don't hesitate to send them to us. Just a tip that the earlier you send us the questions, the more chance there is uh, for us to answer them as we'll take them in the order that we receive them. And you will also see a few questions appear on your screen. So we have audience participation during the webinar. All answers are always anonymous. So please don't hesitate to join <laughs> us during the session and participate. Okay, Margot, I'll start with you for our first question of today, which is very broad. So what is a therapeutic use exemption? A therapeutic use exemption is something that athletes can use if they have an illness or a condition that requires them to take a specific medication that is on the prohibited list. An athlete can apply to be granted a TUE, which gives them their permission to use that drug within the context of the rules of their particular sport. So a TUE is an official medical document giving you as an athlete permission to use a prohibited medication. Thank you, Margo. Pedro, I'll ask the next question to you. And uh, again, uh, we're starting broad and then we'll get more specific as we go on with the webinar. Who requires a therapeutic use exemption? You're also on mute today, Pedro. Sorry. Um, first of all, so we, you are using a medication or a prohibited method. So that's, of course, the first, um, the first step. Very broadly, if you are subject to anti-doping control, then you should really inquire about the need of a QE. Um, we will see later that it can be a, a little bit more complicated, but we will look in detail at uh, what is the level of an athlete when we talk about TUEs. And we'll also look at some case scenarios 
and very logically recreational athletes are not subject to the same requirements as uh, Olympic athletes, for example. And we will cover a few more specifics of who requires a TUE a bit later on, like you said, Pedro. So there are some competitive athletes that do not need to apply for a therapeutic use exemption at certain levels. So um, I guess we'll go into that in a little bit more detail later, Pedro, correct? Yeah, you, there's two ways to know or to have an answer. You can go into the rules of the sport, so in the International Federation rules or the laws of the country, so the, the NATO rules, the National Anti-Doping Agency rules, um, but uh, usually it's simpler to ask. So you can ask your NATO. Your NATO should be your first contact for this, but you can also ask the International Federation. Excellent, thank you. And just a quick note to Stefano, please put your question in the Q&A so we can answer it. It will get lost in the chat. Okay, let's go into our first interactive portion of our presentation. And we have a poll question that is appearing on your screen. Uh, so this one comes uh, courtesy of Pedro. How many therapeutic use exemptions do you think are granted each year around the world? So you have three options to answer either approximately 3,000 or approximately 30,000 or approximately 300,000, a single choice question. And we'll wait for everyone to participate, maybe 60% or so to answer this question. And then Pedro will give us the right answer. In the meantime, I'm looking at the chat so greetings from Cameroon, Serbia, Philippines, very international audience today. Africa Zone 6, Rado, Qatar. There's a shout out to Margo as well from Giovanna. Uh, hello, Dr. Valéry, pleasure to have you here with us. Russian weightlifting, Indonesia sport volleyball. So excellent attendance again. Thank you everyone for joining us. Let's close this poll now and share the response. Uh, most of you have chosen that middle number of approximately 30,000, but Pedro, what is the correct answer? Um, so it's, uh, it's about 3,000. Uh, I, I like to use this, um, this slide because the numbers are so different. It's multiplied by 10 each time, and you would think it would be easy to know. Um, so it's approximately 3,000, and it, it, there is a misconception in the world that um, lots of athletes are using QEs, that they use it to cheat. Um, if you look at the numbers, the numbers are quite low. I mean, 3,000 out of the whole world, the whole population of athletes in the world uh, that would need a QE, uh, in my opinion, it's, it's fairly low. Uh, if you go and look at the Olympics, it's less than 1% of the athletes. Um, once again, uh, it's the exception. It, that's why it's called therapeutic use exempt. No, not exception, but exemption. But, but we could make a little uh, trick with, here with the words. And on this, Margo, we did not put this into the slides, but there has been research that was done recently on whether TUEs have a correlation with performance. Uh, do you mind giving us a very quick note on this? Yes, that's a, a very pivotal publication by Alan Verneck in the British Journal of Sport Medicine. Dr. Verneck is the WADA medical director. And it showed that less than 1% of athletes, as Pedro mentioned, at the Olympic Games have a TUE. And there was no correlation with success at the Olympic Games with a TUE. In other words, not many athletes are using a TUE and it does not give them a performance advantage. Thank you, Margo. And maybe we can stay with you for the next few slides and look at the conditions under which a TUE is granted. Yes. So there are four criteria that, um, that will allow you to have a TUE. And the first one is, is that your health, if you do not take the substance, would be significantly impaired. So you have to have a health problem in order to get a TUE. 
The second criteria is that the substance does not enhance your performance beyond which to bring you back to normal health. As in the, the publication I told you about, a TUE does not give you a performance advantage. The third criteria is that there are no alternative treatments available that are not on the prohibited list. So if you need a drug that is prohibited, but there's another one not on the list, you should use the one not on the prohibited. And the final one is that the need for the use of this substance is not the result of having prior use of a prohibited substance. That's a very important key one, that if you have been doping for years and require and have developed a health problem, require a drug to treat it, you cannot get a TUE for that. Excellent. Thank you, Margot. We can uh, perhaps talk about the timelines of the TUE application next. So, Pedro, I come back to you with this question of when an athlete should apply for a therapeutic use exemption. Yeah, the, there's an easy answer. So that's as soon as you know it. Um, so as soon as you know that you're going to take the medication, uh, you should, uh, if you are subject to the rules, of course, you should contact uh, the anti-doping organization in, in charge of this TUE process. Um, in real life, it's a little bit more difficult sometimes. You may be in a hospital, you had an accident, um, you may be traveling, you may be waiting for a doctor's appointment where you know that you will uh, receive a prescription, but you don't know or you know when will be the appointment, but sometimes it takes a while to to have appointments. Um, in regulations terms, um, if the substance is prohibited at all times, then you should ask for the TUE as soon as possible. Um, if it's prohibited in competition only, then the rules say that you should ask for a TUE at least 30 days before the event. Uh, this is for the organizations to have time to manage your, your TUE and to, to give the athlete also the time to gather uh, the medical information if there is a need for more medical information. So as soon as possible. Thank you, Pedro. I should also mention that if you're hearing terminology like the in-competition period um, that is not familiar, uh, please don't hesitate to look at resources on both the ITA and the WADA pages that define all of this. We also have a webinar on the prohibited list specifically, um, which talks about this. Typically, the in-competition period for most sports is, starts at 11.59 p.m. the day before the competition, so at midnight the day before the event. But there are different definitions in certain sports so do make sure that you check yours. And I should also add that uh, it means that the substance that is prohibited in competition must leave your system by that time, that you don't just stop taking the medication before midnight as it will still be in your system. Okay, so with that side note, maybe we can quickly talk about retroactive uh, therapeutic use exemptions. Pedro, uh, do you want to describe what this means and what the exceptions could be? Um, yes, once again, in real life, you go to the doctor, usually because you're sick. <laughs> uh, you have a huge pain in your shoulder um, and the doctor prescribes a treatment. So um, are, are you really going to wait one or two weeks before receiving the TUE approval? Um, in most cases, it, it's not possible. I mean, you go to the doctor, he gives you a medication, you start taking the medication. This is um, this is an, what goes on in normal life, and even delaying treatment can be uh, well bad for your health. And uh, I'm sure Margot can can confirm that. Um, and so then athletes are faced with a little bit of a difficult situation here. So they should they start the treatment uh, immediately with the risk of a TUE refusal, or should they wait for the approval? Um, to reassure uh, everybody, TUEs are rarely rejected. So people who cheat, they do not usually ask for a TUE. And um, so if you went to the doctor and your doctor is, a, let's say, a normal doctor, 
even though he might not know the anti-doping rules very well, uh, he's going to prescribe you a treatment which is normal, if we can use this word. And uh, any normal treatment would give um, uh, the right to have a TUE. So the TUE process is uh, basically based on the medical process, the normal medical process. And uh, the, there aren't any exceptions that would say that in sports, this treatment is not allowed. No, uh, the TUE process is based on real life, uh, real life medical practice. Thank you, Pedro. You can stay with us for the next poll question that we're going to put up on the screen. Uh, it's getting a little more complicated than the first one. Uh, again, anonymous uh, answers from everybody. So please do participate, even if you have no idea <laughs> what the correct answer is. So for the purpose of simultaneous translation, the question is, what is the most common condition and drug class requiring a therapeutic use exemption? And this one is multiple choice, which may give you a hint that there's more than one correct answer. You have options of stimulants like amphetamines for ADHD, which is the attention deficit hyper hyperactivity disorder. You have beta-2 agonists for asthma-related conditions. And the third one is glucocorticoids for respiratory illnesses or due to injuries. So, so far, 50% of you have uh, submitted your answer. Please don't hesitate to take a guess. Okay, so almost 70% participation. Thank you, everyone who has submitted their answers. Let's share the results with you all. So we have the top one is the asthma-related conditions at 65 and glucocorticoids closely behind. Uh, Pedro, do you want to tell us what the right answer to this question is? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. This is an interesting one. So they're, they're the, the three most uh, used or the three most uh, uh, substance classes that we receive requests for. Um, they're, they're at approximately at the same level, uh, depending on age category, depending on the sport a little bit, usually mostly related to age category. Um, so the first, uh, uh, the first, uh, uh, the first, uh, I'm missing my word in English, sorry. Uh, idée reçue, how do you say idée reçue in English? Idée reçue. Yes, the first misconception. Misconception, is that, there you go. Yes, the yes. first misconception is that asthma, uh, so that beta 2 agonists are extremely popular as theories. So this is uh, true and false at the same time. It's false because most medications for asthma are not prohibited. So in this classification here, beta 2 agonists actually appear third. Um, the first that we have is stimulants. So that's the first one in there. The, the, in the number of applications that we receive. And uh, the second is glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids have this particularity that they are forbidden in competition only. So um, if you are, let's say, injured for several months and you need the glucocorticoid treatment, then you would not need the TUE because you are not participating in, um, in events. So that's why their number is not as high as other as the other substances. Thank you, Pedro. This is a good transition for us to look at common conditions requiring a therapeutic use exemption. So Margot, for this slide, I go back to you. Thank you, Olia. On the screen, you can read some of the common conditions. Um, we talked already about hyper um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder requiring a stimulant. As Pedro mentioned, there are many of the asthma medications that have levels that you can take the substance without a TUE. Now we don't see a lot of high level athletes with diabetes, but insulin is on the list, prohibited list. Intravenous infusions is not a condition, it's a treatment, but it is a method that is prohibited outside of the hospital. 
The inflammatory bowel disease requires glucocorticoids, which is on the list. And importantly, most recently, if you require an injection of glucocorticoids into a joint or around a tendon for a musculoskeletal injury, injected glucocorticoids are most recently added to the prohibited list. So this is a small list of some of the common conditions. As an athlete, I did have an injection as well. This is, I think, the only one I was familiar with before actually working in anti-doping. But you, you know that you have a cortisone injection when you have one. Uh, let's, now, uh, the cortisone, just to clarify, the cortisone is only prohibited in competition. There you go. Yes, exactly. If we go to the next question that we have for the audience, um, as you know, we do like audience participation. So we've put another poll question in which Margot will give us the answer to. Um, so uh, kind of the opposite question now of which of the below conditions do you think do not require a TUE? So there's again, a hint there that is a multiple choice question. So more than one correct answer. And it could be either eczema requiring hydrocortisone. Is it oral antibiotics for bronchitis? or is it intravenous infusion during a hospital procedure? So you have three options to choose from. We've got 40% of you that have participated. And thank you everyone for your comments. Uh, we're glad that you are enjoying this webinar and for the shout outs telling us where you are all from. I'm just looking at the chat, we have India, Ethiopia, Solomon Island, Motorsport Kenya, Cameroon, and maybe a few others that I've already mentioned, Sudan, and a Portuguese curler, UCI paracycling. Welcome again, everybody. Okay, 70% of participation, let's share the results. And the most popular one is the oral antibiotics for bronchitis, saying that we do not require a TUE for this. Uh, Margot, what is the correct answer here? Well, you are correct that antibiotics do not require therapeutic use exemption. But those who also answered eczema requiring hydrocortisone, which is a glucocorticoid, are also correct because topical or on the skin does not require a therapeutic use exemption of glucocorticoids. If it's oral or intravenous or injected, then in competition you would require. So skin does not require a therapeutic use exemption. And finally, as I alluded to just recently, an intravenous infusion during a hospital procedure does not require a TUE. So all of you are correct. Thank you, Margo. We've put a few trick questions as you can see. Uh, from the polls, but hopefully this give you an example, a practical real life example of what this therapeutic use exemption process is. Pedro, I'll come back to you now for the next slide. Um, what are the steps that an athlete needs to take uh, when they need to apply for a therapeutic use exemption? Um, so if we put it very simply, you need to feel a request. The request is a TUE form and then you gather the medical records to prove your condition and send them to the organization that is in charge of the TUEs for you. Um, it, this is the most important. It might be a little bit more complicated to know if you need to send them to your international federation or to your national anti-doping organization, but you in the end you don't really need to be worried because if you send it to the NADO and it should be sent to the IEF then the NADO will forward and vice versa NADOs and IEFs are in constant uh, contact the, we, we know each other very well and it's part of our work to be in in contact so What's really important is fill the TUI form and gather the medical information. That's really, really important. Just filling the form and writing a sentence saying the athlete is sick uh, is not enough. You need diagnostic information. You need the history of the, of the disease. You need a, a good description of the treatment plan 
and all this is uh, described on the on the resources that you will show at the end and on the IF International Federation webpage or on the National Anti-Doping Organization webpage. And I'm sure Margot will agree with me as we always like to promote the WADA checklists, uh, which are really great. And we've put a link to those in the resources that you will receive after the presentation. And these should guide the physicians to be able to provide the right information. Let's take a look at the life cycle of a TUE on the next slide. Uh, Margot, could you speak um, to this visual here? Yes, very happy to. So let's start off on the one side of your screen where you're diagnosed with your condition. And as an athlete, you've taken the, um, the application to your physician. Very important that your physician fills the application out completely. And there is a checklist that we will talk about at the end. This TUE goes to your anti-doping organization. Then this is the part that happens behind the scenes. The organization sends it to a panel of experts. So this is called a TUE committee. This independent panel of experts review the file. That can take about three weeks. And they render a decision that is then sent back to the anti-doping organization that will communicate with you. Very important to remember that your TUE if granted, has a time frame and an expiry date. So important that you note when you need to reapply if you are still using that medication. Thank you, Margot. Uh, let's try to take a look at a few uh, case studies that we prepared uh, to again illustrate some of the practical uh, applications and the realities of uh, a TUE. So we have a case study, again, with a question for the audience. Uh, Pedro, do you mind going over this for the purpose of simultaneous translation? I mean, I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't see you very well, but I can remember the case very well, as you probably know why. So this is a 44-year-old male um, who is going to participate in the Swiss Rowing Championships. And he's staying Mometa, taking Mometazone daily. Should World Rowing process this TUE grant it or not? And if you want to tell us what Mometazone is, for those that don't know. Uh, it's a glucocorticoid. Excellent. So we've got yes, no, or not enough information. So if you were world rowing, I don't know if we have any rowers or representatives of the IF here today. I saw, I saw one in the list. <laughs> so we There's always do. one. <laughs> so why did you choose this case study while we're waiting for the answers to come in? So the, the detective ones will have understood that it's me. <laughs> I can All give right. a little bit more of description. I have I had a, a rhinite, a rhinitis. So uh, mometazone was given by a push, by inhalation mm -hmm. daily. Okay, so let's, let's check the answer to your case study now. We've got uh, almost 70% of you have participated and the answers are on your screen. Indeed, 50% uh, said not enough information and 34% said yes, that rowing, world rowing should grant this TUE. Yeah, so this is a good case of incomplete information. So first of all, you didn't know that it was by uh, inhalation. And most importantly, it's even uh, wrong information here because it's not the Swiss rowing championships, but it was the Swiss masters rowing championships. And being 44 years old, you might have, you might have guessed it, but uh, this is a typical case where uh, people don't know very well, and they write an email, and there's a few exchanges to know exactly the situation. So masters rowers are recreational. They are not international level. I'm certainly not international level or even national level. So this means that in the unlikely case of a test, I would be allowed uh, retroactive TUI. So after the test, I would be allowed to ask for a TUI. There is not the same requirement as for international level athletes to ask in advance for the TUI. 
Okay, thank you, Pedro. We can take a look at case study number two now. Uh, this is, again, do you want to go over this one or should I read it out, Pedro? Um, yeah, I, uh, so this is a 27 year old female, um, same omethasone, same treatment, let's say, so also by inhalation. Um, she's competing at the World Rowing Championships, so she is definitely international level. Okay, great. So we have answers coming in. Again, uh, the question remains the same. Should world rowing process and grant this TUE? And the options are yes, no, or not enough information. And very quick responses coming in. Thank you everyone for being so fast to respond. All right, let's share the responses back. So you can see what everybody uh, attending today has selected. We've got 51% that said yes. And uh, second answer behind is not enough information at 35%. So Pedro, what do you think? Yes, um, two, two questions in one. So should the world rowing process this? Yes, they should. It's an international level athlete. And uh, these athletes are, um, um, let's say, managed by, by International Federation. Um, should they grant this TUE? Let's go to the next slide to, to answer the question. And um, we, we've uh, talked a little bit about this during the presentation. So the route of administration here is important. And um, uh, as Margot just said a few minutes ago, so if it would have been topical administration, so on the skin, it would not have been forbidden. Um, uh, so what's forbidden is what is called systemic administration. Uh, simply put, this means that the substance will go through your whole body. So it's been either injected in your bloodstream or you've taken it uh, orally and then it goes to your stomach and then goes in the bloodstream. Again, um, Margot, please not if I'm not saying anything stupid. <laughs> uh, I'm not a physician, sorry. So I, I talk under her supervision. Um, anything else which is uh, so non-systemic, so this would be uh, the skin or the a little spray in the nose, these are not forbidden at all. So once again, what's forbidden is systemic, so injections orally, rectally, and during the in-competition period. So that was the, the goal of this uh, little slide. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, Margo is nodding, so you've got everything correct so far, but I'm also very careful as a, a non-medical expert to follow your expert lead. Uh, the website that we are using is globaldraw.com, which is a great resource to check your medications. Again, if uh, the methods of administration uh, this terminology is new to you, please do check out our other webinars and resources to get informed on this topic. Uh, but we do have a lot of questions, so we'll actually go straight to useful tips, uh, for which, uh, Margo, I'll let you talk about useful TUE tips and also tips while being tested. Thank you, Pedro. Great cases because it demonstrates the complexity for some people. So some tips for you as either an athlete or someone who works in anti-doping, make sure you check the list when you get a prescription. Not all physicians around the world are familiar with the WADA prohibited list. As an athlete, you are responsible to do that. Make sure your TUE application is fully filled out completely. It will be a time delay if it's not completed accurately and it needs to be sent back for more information. So please use the checklists that WADA provides to ensure that your application is complete. If you have a change in dose in your medication, you will have to apply for a new TUE. Very important. If you've got a TUE, it's for the specific dose change the dose. Re and as I mentioned before, all TUEs expire. If you don't renew that and you still are taking the medication, you could trigger a positive anti-doping rule violation. 
So very important to have your calendar marked in a phone agenda to say in advance of the expiry date, reapply. Preferably two or three months ahead, but definitely one month ahead to reapply for your new TUE. If we look at the next one, next slide, we also have uh, tips for when you are tested and you may have a therapeutic use exemption. Yes, I receive this question often from athletes. What do I do if I'm being tested because I am taking a prohibited substance? But you have permission to, so not to worry. First of all, write it on your form. Anything that you take should be written on the form with it that anything you've taken within seven days or blood transfusions over three months. So please write your medication on the form. You may want to add on the form that you have an approved TUE for that substance. You do not need to show your paper during doping control because it is in the WADA system called ADAMS. That's the computer system that that keeps all the information. So while you do not need to have the piece of paper, if you have it, you can show, but all you need to do is write it on the form, the medication. So not to worry, write it down. Excellent, thank you, Margot. Uh, we are now coming to the summary of our session today. And I'm happy that we have quite a bit of time to go over, over all the questions that have come in, and there's some really good ones in there. A very quick summary here. Um, we wanted to also bust the myth of therapeutic use exemptions giving a performance advantage. They are meant to allow athletes to maintain their health. And it's very important that athletes understand the TUE application process, even if they don't have a health condition, there may be an injury or something else that may require them to file a TUE. If you still have any questions, um, our email addresses, both the TUE one and the education one are in this deck, so you can contact us. Uh, remember, incomplete uh, files will result in a delay, so make sure you provide all the information that is required. And of course, give time for the TUE process to take place. As you saw in the life cycle of a TUE, that there are quite a few steps to the process and that takes some time, but it also keeps the process transparent and independent. And finally, this reminder again, to always keep track of the TUE expiry date, but also of the prohibited list as it comes out uh, with a new version in October of each year. And there may be changes that will impact whether or not you have to apply for a TUE. Okay. Great, now a quick touch base on the resources that we have at the end of each uh, deck and each webinar. On the next slide, you will see uh, some of the resources that we recommend. Uh, on the right-hand side is the screenshot of some of the checklists that WADA provides, which are fantastic for sports physicians and doctors working with athletes. And we've also kept some of the information uh, from the IT website, like our form, our definition of international level athletes and some general information. So feel free to take a look. Great. So I'm going to open up the Q&A box now and we can tackle the questions that have come in. Again, thank you everybody for writing in to ask us questions. I'll start from the top, a question from Marco. How innovation will or could influence the TUE process? And what do you think needs to be improved? Uh, maybe, Margo, I'll go to you first, and then Pedro, you can add. Um, great question. Thanks for, for the tough questions to start us off. So how could innovation influence the TUE process and what needs to be improved? I think one of the most important things that need to be improved is people's understanding of the process, which is what we are actually doing today. The actual process itself from the WADA perspective is carefully reviewed by the WADA TUE committee on a regular basis. And when they do so, a new international standard comes out. Um, recognizing that it can be complex in some situations, 
as you saw by the world rowing cases that Pedro announced, it would be nice if we could streamline some of the complexity for ease of understanding. However, the world is as it is. And when the prohibited list is, is uh, decided, we have to work the therapeutic use exemption process around the list. So while the list remains complex, so will the TUE process. Thank you, Margot. Pedro, anything to add before we move on to the next question? I completely agree. The, the only uh, bad thing about the theory process that I can see is the anxiety that it creates on the athletes. So everything said, Margot said is correct. You need better education of the athletes, but also of the support personnel. Um, it's, it's a complex system. It's a complex world with different kinds of treatments around the world and the doctors are not necessarily doing or knowing that they are doing a bad thing but uh, yeah uh, knowing the rules and the process is essential and before we go to the next one uh, I'll just quickly respond to Yanis Ann in the chat who said uh, who's asking to show the resources. Uh, we can put them up for a few seconds, absolutely, so you can see. Um, but you will also notice that they're clickable links. So when you get the PDF of the presentation, uh, you will also be able to click on these resources and see them. But let's put them up for, for our audience for just a few seconds. Uh, otherwise, it's just a placeholder Q&A slide. Anyway, good. So moving on to our next question from Dr. Wael is the, um, are the COVID-19 uh, pandemic drugs and treatments uh, considered, or do they need a TUE? So um, Pedro, do you want me to take this one? Um, yes, please. Okay, so the uh, antiviral medications are not on the wadded prohibited list, but if you're a physician, if you're very ill and in hospital and require glucocorticoids systemically, so remember that's oral or intravenous, then in your in competition, you would need to have a TUE. Now, unlikely if you're in hospital uh, re requiring systemic glucocorticoids, you're likely not in competition. So the answer is for most individuals, you will not need a TUE for COVID-19 pandemic related treatments. Excellent, thank you. Pedro, all good for this one? I, I agree, yes. Excellent, okay. Um, I will go to you then for the next one from France. I'm guessing the question is uh, from the 3000 or so uh, therapeutic use exemption applications that we receive, um, maybe the positive answer is referring to whether it was approved or not. Um, so, I, that's how I understood. Um, mm -hmm. So 3000 is the number of approved theories. Um, I, I, these are all over the world from all, from all organizations. So I, I can't tell you how many were refused on top of this, uh, on, of this 3000. I know on our side, we have so 30 out of more than 1000, which are rejected. So the rejections are, uh, relatively rare. I think that was the main question. Mm -hmm. I think so too. I hope we interpreted that question correctly. Let's go to the next one from Bahar. Um, the criteria number four, which is a reminder, it is if the use of a TUE or a prohibited substance is a result of prior use of a prohibited substance. Um, under this criteria, if an athlete was doping and they need a TUE, then the TUE would not be granted because they were doping. Now, if uh, that previous substance was again needed as a result of a health issue, what if the player's health necessitated the use? Should the player discontinue playing as an athlete? Uh, Margot, what do you think about this one? Um, yes. Oh yeah, Pedro, go ahead. I, I, I didn't understand the question in the same way. I think yeah, me either. <laughs> yes, I think if he says that the TUI is refused, uh, should the player stop being an athlete that's how i read it i don't know if Margot, uh, you maybe. Have a third yes uh, maybe i went one step further with my interpretation but uh <laughs> yes go ahead <laughs> i actually interpret it slightly differently as well if a player's health needs the use a therapeutic use exemption would be granted 
Correct. So yes. that person can continue on as an athlete. That's the first criteria. Let's say the athlete's application was refused uh, for that. Then we don't want to discontinue the athlete's um, participation in sport. Perhaps another medication would suffice. You have to ask why was the, the TUE refused and understand that. You want to keep athletes participating. That's why we have the TUE process in good health. Pedro, anything to add? Yeah, refusals uh, need to be very well explained because the athletes have the right to appeal. That's a very, very strong right that they have. Um, I'm trying to think of reasons for uh, refusing a TUE. Um, you would have usually the most important reason is that there is a, an allowed non-prohibited treatment um, other from that it would be um, controversial treatments maybe where the treatment is not approved internationally once again these are quite rare so uh, they're all all of them are very particular cases and very different from each other all right let's uh, let's go to the next one we hope that we interpreted the question correctly uh, I was quite creative my, with my interpretation, but yours sounds more practical, Pedro <laughs> and Marco. Uh, let's go back to Franz for his question as the definition of ADHS, which I, I'm wondering if it's ADHD, since that's what we talked about during the webinar, is uh, rather weak or let's say broad. What are the criteria for you to provide a TUE? Um, I don't know who wants to go first for this one. Well, I'll start perhaps, uh, and then sure. Pedro can follow up um, as this is a, quite a medical question. So ADHD has very defined criteria for the granting of a TUE. And this information can be found in the WADA medical information guides. So it would be helpful for the athlete to show the physician this medical information to assist physicians. And so the criteria are very clearly laid out there of what documentation is required. Now, I won't go through them today on this webinar, but refer you to the WADA website in the resources that shows the checklists and information for physicians to provide the accurate and appropriate information for the TUE to be granted. Pedro, anything to add? Um, yeah, I, I feel a little bit in the question, uh, this um, perception that ADHD is a, a disease that is too broadly defined, that there's a little bit of a medical war between maybe Europe and the US or North America. Um, we don't, as as TUI managers, we don't enter this discussion. Really, we uh, we are here to verify that the athlete has been uh, diagnosed by a psychiatrist. That's very important. The the TUI application and the, all the medical documentation needs to be provided by certified psychiatrists, uh, doctors. Um, I mean, doctors in the sense of uh, physicians and it uh, needs to be serious. And there's, like Margot said, a whole series of uh, diagnosis criteria. And uh, yes, it's not our role to um, study the differences in treatments between the whole world and why in Denmark they use terbutaline and why in France they use salbutamol. That's, that's not uh, really our role. Always good to have uh, <laughs> tricky questions that we address in our webinars and we're happy to, to take them on. So thank you for your question. Uh, a few good ones coming in. There was a question about Rafael Nadal. Of course, we cannot comment on specific athlete cases and all the, the files are very much confidential. Um, so we won't answer that question, but we can move on to, to the one from Omar. And the question perhaps, is- um, Perhaps yeah. only if I could just comment. I like the question because it allows us to emphasize the confidentiality. As an athlete, your information is confidential and it will not be made public. So correct, we will not answer that question. 
Uh, and it does um, underscore or emphasize the point that this is a confidential process for all athletes. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's an important point to make. And we can maybe try to tackle two more questions in the final minutes. Um, I'll go to Omar's question next. And it is whether any medical report should be accepted by the committee or it has to be by a specialist in the same health condition. So maybe both of you Pedro, are ready to you answer. To start? <laughs> we are, but Pedro, I usually answer first. So your turn. Let's go quickly. Um, usually what we receive is either the theory has been submitted by the specialist, so it's uh, it's quite easy, or it's a, a family, a, a general practitioner, and we have documentation coming from a specialist. So uh, that's the, the, the most usual case. So you wouldn't have a general practitioner making a diagnosis decision on a psych psychiatric case for example that they will always have documentation that they received from a specialist and that's how they analyze the whole situation and the only caveats i would add is that in some parts of the world there is limited access to specialists and some family physicians are competent as long as the wada checklist of the criteria is there then a tue can be granted for those individuals excellent thank you Okay, let's uh, try one more from uh, Marion, who is asking, who determines if an athlete is international level? I do understand that not all athletes who compete internationally are considered as international level. So maybe Pedro again, you can kick that off. Yeah, very quickly in the anti-doping rules of each federation, on, usually on the second page, there is a, a, a scope uh, that says international level athletes that need to submit the TUE for the International Federation are described as follows. And then you have uh, top 64 or participating in the world championships. Um, if uh, your federation is working with the ITA, we have on our TUE page also the definition for all federations. I think that would be in the resources in the presentation. Correct, yes, we do have a link to the definitions. Uh, which will hopefully be helpful. Uh, anything final to add for this, Margo, before we wrap up? All good. Nope. Okay. Well done, Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So we can wrap up this webinar with one minute to go. And uh, if you still have any questions that weren't answered today, we're sorry we weren't able to get to everybody. Um, there were a lot of good questions in the Q&A. Uh, do email us at education at it.sport. And of course, I'd like to say a big thank you to both Margo and Pedro for your contribution to this session and to everybody who was also participating with us uh, and answering all the poll questions, uh, writing to us and uh, writing questions in the Q&A. We really appreciate your participation. Excellent. So we will wrap up with our final slide. If you would like to stay in touch with us, you can click the link when you receive the slides or scan the QR code to sign up for the mailing list. Um, and that will be the end of our presentation today. Again, a big thank you to you, Margo and Pedro. We really appreciate your time. And I will say good morning, good night, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And we'll be back again next month with a new topic. Thank you very much.